Okay, you're on. Okay. Well, we finally did it. This is the last class that we will have on the book of Exodus. Uh, we're going to cover six chapters tonight. But in covering these six chapters, I might point out that a lot of the information in these last six chapters about the tabernacle and the construction of the tab tabernacle will repeat a lot of the matters that we studied or the about the tabernacle in the earlier chapters that we looked at when Moses was given the instructions on the tabernacle when he was on the mountain of Sinai. I start with the quote that I think points to the main topic that our main point that we want to make from the lesson and that is Exodus 39 verses 42 43. The Israelites had done all the work just as the Lord had commanded Moses. Moses inspected the work and saw that they had done it just as the Lord had commanded. So Moses blessed them. So what we're going to look at following the same format procedure we followed in the last few classes, we're going to go and study these last six chapters of the book of Exodus, chapters 35 through 40. And these chapters are the ones that describe the actual construction of the tabernacle. The point in time is Moses had come down from Mount Sinai a second time, carrying with him the second set of stone commandments, the Ten Commandments. And now the scriptures talk about how the people of Israel were called together to construct and assemble the tabernacle. And we're going to then have in part two a discussion around two questions that come out of what we're going to learn tonight. So when we look at chapters 35 through 40, we start with last week, we focused on the person of Moses, who became God's beloved servant and who in his life and in his actions foreshadowed Jesus as God's son. And the summary of Moses life, which I like to use frequently is, we learned how in human terms, Moses started out as somebody he was the son of the Pharaoh. He was the heir apparent to the Egyptian throne. So in human terms, he was really an important person. Then he became in human terms, a nobody. He was exiled from Egypt. He went to the desert of Midian. He was a shepherd, the lowliest of all professions. And he's out there pretty much by himself. And then in the final third of his life, he became God's servant leading God's people out of Egypt and through the wilderness. And Moses' life is divided into 40 year periods. The 40 years where he was, grew up in Egypt as an heir to the Pharaoh, the 40 years he spent in the desert as a shepherd, and then the 40 years he spent leading the people of Israel out of Egypt and through the wilderness. We used Moses' walk and service to the Lord as an example and an inspiration for our walk and service to the Lord. And the lesson that we took out of last week was we learned that faith in God and hope in God's promises enables us to become close to God and obedient to God's will in our lives. So this week, we're going to focus on how the construction and assembly of the tabernacle reveals to us what is required in order for us to do God's work in a manner which is acceptable to God. And the main message that I want you to get from tonight's lesson is that in order for us to serve God in a manner which is pleasing and acceptable to God, we must first rest in the Lord and set aside the desires of the flesh. Second, we must freely and joyfully offer our gifts and services from the heart. And third, we must perform our services guided by the Holy Spirit and in obedience to God's instructions, his word. So we get to this main point that I want to make from tonight's lesson by starting with an overview of these six chapters, chapters 35 through 40 of the book of Exodus. Then we're going to go in the, uh, an outline and talk about the lessons from Exodus, which reveal the requirements for acceptable service to God. Then the third topic we're going to talk about is the construction and assembly of the tabernacle, 
was inspected, judged, and approved by Moses. And this foreshadowed Jesus' inspection, judgment, and approval of our works. Then the fourth part, God manifested his presence and glory after the work was finished and approved. We'll get to the discussion questions and then some conclusions. So let's dive into these six chapters. Uh, the overview and summary of chapters 35 through 40. Now, these are the chapters that describe the actual construction and assembly of the tabernacle, its furnishings, and the garments of the priest. Everything that was done to construct the tabernacle and its furnishings and to make the garments for the priests were according to the instructions that God gave to Moses on Mount Sinai. Now, these chapters repeat many of the details that we already learned about the materials that were used in the tabernacle, the number of materials, uh, the, uh, how they were positioned, and what the significance was. But what we have here are some insights with respect to how God's work was carried out by the Israelite people and how it was according to the pattern and the instructions that God gave to Moses. The, it's interesting to note the repetition and recapitulation of the details regarding the construction and assembly of the tabernacle has significance all by itself because it really foreshadows God's plan of redemption of the world. The instructions which God gave to Moses on Mount Sinai foreshadowed the plans which God made in heaven at the very beginning for Christ to redeem the world. The completion of the tabernacle on earth foreshadowed the completion of God's redemptive plan on earth by Christ. So what we literally have in the repetition that's in the scriptures in Exodus is that these chapters in Exodus, chapters 25 through 31, which are repeated again in chapters 35 through 39, affirm that God's redemptive plan, which was originally designed in heaven, was brought into reality by being accomplished on earth. So you can see that duality has spiritual significance. In addition to that, the order and the information presented in chapters 35 through 40 reveal the requirements which must be met in order for our efforts to serve God to be accepted by God. In chapter 35, the first three verses mentions the Sabbath for the seventh time in the book of Exodus. You think we've had enough talking about the Sabbath? Well, we're gonna talk about the Sabbath again. In chapters 35, uh, four through, uh, verses four through 29, it identifies all the materials which the people of Israel voluntarily brought to Moses to construct the tabernacle. In chapters 35, 30 through chapter 39, 43, it describes the work of those appointed by God to construct the tabernacle and the actual construction of the tabernacle and the furnishings. We get into the, the construction itself. Exodus ends in chapter 40, which describes Moses' inspection and approval of the work, the assembly of the tabernacle by Moses and God manifesting his presence and glory. So, the meat of this lesson really comes into the first section we're going to talk about lessons which reveal the requirements for acceptable service to God. First, we must set aside our own desires and listen to God. It's interesting that before the scriptures go into the actual construction, the work on the tabernacle itself, it starts with the Sabbath. And it starts with the Sabbath but adds a little bit more information we didn't study before. In chapter 35, verses one through three, Moses assembled the whole community of the Israelites and reminded them about the Sabbath. Exodus 35, one through three says, Moses assembled the whole Israelite community and said to them, these are the things the Lord has commanded you to do. For six days work is to be done, but the seventh day shall be your holy day, a Sabbath of rest to the Lord. Whoever does any work on it must be put to death. And then it adds this instruction. Do not light a fire in any of your dwellings on the Sabbath day. That's interesting. This is, as I said before, the seventh time that the Sabbath is talked about in the book of Exodus. The seventh has 
a, a number dealing with perfection, holiness, completeness. The reference to the Sabbath, adding the requirement that no one is to build a fire on the Sabbath day really has significance. We already studied last week and in our other discussions of the Sabbath, how the Sabbath day is a day where we set aside time devoted to and establishing the relationship with our God. It's a time that we commune with God. The reference in these verses for the people not to build a fire on the Sabbath day calls the people to put aside their own comforts, their own activities. In other words, to put aside their desires, their comforts, their gratifications, and the needs of the flesh. Why? You put aside those needs so you can focus on the spiritual relationship with God. The Sabbath day is to be a day of delight, enjoyment, and communion with God and the manifestation of his glory. I think the point comes clear that the reason that these verses are put at the very beginning of the discussion of the building of the tabernacle is that before the Israelites could perform God's work on the tabernacle, they were required to rest in the Lord. What do you do when you rest in the Lord? You study his word, you pray, you have fellowship with God, you're prepared to serve God. You're prepared to do God's work. You're prepared to receive God's instructions and guidance on how to do God's work. We basically have six days to perform the work, but one day to get reoriented with God, to get in re reunited fellowship, to keep our compass focused on the Lord. So the principle of the first requirement in order to serve God is that before we can perform God's work, our attitude and focus must be on God and not on ourselves or what we want. It's about God. And so a day of rest, a day set aside to the Lord is important before you get started. Then we get to the second requirement that comes out of these scriptures in the book of Exodus. Um, we must freely and joyfully give our offerings from the heart. In chapter 25, verses 1 and 2, we studied this already. God instructed Moses to ask the people to give offerings so that the tabernacle could be built. In chapter 35, verses 21 and 22, we learn how the people of Israel responded to God's request. In verse, chapter 35, verses 21 through 22, and everyone who was willing and whose heart was moved came and brought an offering to the Lord for the work on the tent of the meeting, for all its service and for all the sacred garments. All who were willing, men and women alike, came and brought gold jewelry of all kinds, brooches, earrings, rings, and ornaments. They all presented their gold as a wave offering to the Lord. Everyone who had blue, purple, or scarlet yarn, or fine linen, or goat hair, ram skins dyed red, or hides of sea cows brought them. Those presenting an offering of silver or bronze brought it as an offering to the Lord. And everyone who had acacia wood for any part of the work brought it. What we hear, see here is the emphasis on a voluntary, freely given, joyful offering to the Lord. They weren't responding to Moses. They were responding to the Lord. You know, it's important that if we're going to serve God, that what we offer to the Lord is offered from the heart, not out of duty, not out of obligation, but from the heart, a heart that is faithful, trusting, and loving to God. So we see that God is building the way that we serve him. Having rested and delighted in the Lord on the Sabbath day, getting oriented and focused on God, the hearts of the Israelites were moved by the spirit to give and give abundantly. Later in this same chapter, we see how they gave so much that the builders came to Moses and said, tell them to stop bringing stuff. We have more than enough to do the work. Basically, if we, uh, in doing God's work, gave from the heart, then the spirit would move the people of God to give abundantly and God will never be left uh, wanting for more materials or, or services. Now, the other thing that's important here is 
the offerings for the tabernacle were made by the whole community of the Israelites. The men and women brought gold, which was for the glory of God. The men, if you recall, brought all the silver because that was a redemptive offering. It was for the redemption of God's people. The women contributed their skills by spinning the blue, purple, scarlet, and fine white linen and goat's hair, which were used to build the tabernacle. And they also contributed their brass mirrors, which were used to build the laver. The rulers brought the onyx and precious stones to make the breastplate. The rulers brought the most precious of the stones, setting an example of contributing indestructible and everlasting materials to the service of God. Lead by example. And the example of the rulers was the most precious of the stones that were used to make the breastplate that was worn over the heart of the garment worn by the priest. So the materials and services contributed by the people were measured and counted. In Exodus 38, verse 21, the scriptures reveal, these are the amounts of the materials used for the tabernacle. The tabernacle of the testimony, which were recorded at Moses' command by the Levites under the direction of Elamar, son of Aaron, the priest. It's important to know what we give to the Lord, what we do the for, Lord is recorded, it's counted, it has value. And just like Moses recorded the offerings made by the people and measured and counted them, God is measuring and counting the services that we give to him. So what we started with is, we start with the or, our orienting our focus on the day of Sabbath to God and his will and serving him. We, next, it flows into offering from the heart, our gifts and services to the Lord. Third, using the skills, wisdom and guidance of the spirit, the work of building the tabernacle was performed by those called by the spirit. Exodus 36, one says, so Bezalel and Oabab and every skilled person whom the Lord has given skill and ability to know how to carry out all the work of constructing the sanctuary are to do the work just as the Lord had commanded. Isn't it interesting? Everything is about the Lord in service to the Lord and given with the skills that the Lord gives. And what we have here is God calling people to serve him and to use the gifts that the spirits give to the people and to follow the instructions that God gave. This is an important point. The construction of the tabernacle, the furnishings and the garments of the priests was done in accordance with the precise instructions which God had given Moses. In chapter 39, I think it's no accident that the scriptures repeat eight different times that the work of the tabernacle was done in quote, as the Lord commanded Moses. And I identify the verses where this is repeated throughout this chapter of Exodus. In verses 32 and 42, the scriptures add in addition to, as the Lord commanded Moses, and the children of Israel did according to all that the Lord had commanded Moses. So what we have here is obedience to the word of God, obedience to the instructions of God about the construction of the tabernacle. And then the the important point is through the Holy Spirit, the workers were given the skills, wisdom, and abilities to perform the work. Boy, what does that say about service to the Lord? No room is left for any of the workers to improvise or take credit for what they did. The design and specifications were from God. The work and actions of the workers were guided by the Spirit. God built the tabernacle he used human instrumentalities that were faithful and obedient to him to do so. This tells us that in order to receive God's blessings for the work we're called to do, we must faithfully follow, follow God's instructions and use the gifts given to us by the Holy Spirit. So what do we have is the three things required to serve God faithfully. We have to set aside time to talk with God, to commune with God, to rest with God, to find out what God wants us to do. And then we have to be led by the spirit to have a heart to give our services to the Lord. We're serving God, not ourselves. And finally, we have to rely upon the instructions that God gives and the guidance of the Holy Spirit, and the gifts of the Holy Spirit to carry out God's work.
So we get to the next section. We talk about the construction and assembly of the tabernacle was inspected, judged, and approved by Moses, foreshadowing Jesus' inspection, judgment, and approval of our works. See, after the work of the tabernacle was done and the furnishings and the sacred garments were completed, Moses, they brought it all to Moses and Moses inspected it. And in Exodus 39, verses 42, 43, it says, the Israelites had done all the work just as the Lord had commanded Moses. Moses inspected the work and saw that they had done it just as the Lord commanded. So Moses blessed them. When we see that the work is being brought to Moses, Moses is the intermediary between God and the people. Moses received the instructions. He gave the instructions, the spirit of God and the instructions were followed. The materials and the tabernacle was built and it was returned to Moses and Moses inspected it. The, Moses as a mediator between God and the people to do God's work foreshadows what Jesus does with his church, with his people. When Christ returns to receive his people before he comes back to earth for the millennial kingdom and before the day of judgment, he is going to judge the work of his people. This is the evaluative judgment that we talk about in scripture. In 2 Corinthians 5.10, Paul says, so we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due him for the things he's done while in the body, whether good or bad. In 1 Corinthians 3, 10 through 15, Paul writes, by the grace of God, grace God has given me, I laid the foundation as an expert builder and someone else is building on it. But each one should be careful how he builds for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If any man builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, his work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. If what he has built survives, he will receive his reward. If it is burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. So when we look at this second part of 1 Corinthians verses, uh, chapter 3, verses 10 through 15, we're really talking about Christian service. And when we're talking about 2 Corinthians verse uh, 5, uh, chapter 5, verse 10, we're talking about our walk or life with Christ. You know, the reference to gold speaks always of God's glory. To silver speaks of God's redemption. And to precious stones speaks to what is imperishable, which will survive, survive the test of fire. Gold, silver, and precious stones represent the services which are offered for God's glo glory based upon the plan of redemption and which will endure the test of fire and shall be re rewarded. So these things are tied together by God's plan of redemption. And that which is precious gold and glorifies God, that is based upon Christ will be eternal and be blessed and rewarded. In contrast, wood and hay and stubble are the services which do not endure the test of fire of God's evaluated judgment. So gold, silver, and precious stones are offerings of the spirit. And they're in accordance with God's will. Wood, hay, and stubble are offerings of the flesh. And so what we see here in the construction, the assembly of the tabernacle is a, an example or a foretelling of what our services are to our Lord in service to God. The next section we're gonna talk about how God manifested his presence and glory after the work on the tabernacle was finished and approved. As the scriptures reveal, Moses was the only person who assembled and finished the tabernacle. In Exodus 40, verses 18 and 19, it says, when Moses set up the tabernacle, he put the bases in place, erected the frames, inserted the crossbars, and set up the posts. Then he spread the tent over the tabernacle and put the covering over the tent as the Lord commanded him. Notice how all the other workers disappear from the scriptures. And we have Moses erecting everything and putting it together. And in verse 33, 
of Exodus chapter 40. And it said, and so Moses finished the work. Anytime you have a reference to Moses finishing something, it foreshadows Christ finishing the work. Moses completing the work foreshadowed Jesus Christ completing the work. The spiritual application to us is affirmed in Hebrews chapter 3, verses 3 through 6, which says, Jesus has been found worthy of, great, worthy of greater honor than Moses, just as a builder of a house has greater honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but God is a builder of everything. Moses was faithful as a servant in all God's house, testifying as to what would be said in the future. But Christ is faithful as a son over God's house, and we are his house, if we hold on to our courage and the hope of what we boast. So what we see here in Moses assembling the tabernacle, finishing the work, foreshadows Christ and his finishing the work uh, as uh, over the church and over God's plan of redemption. So the construction and the assembly of the tabernacle being finished and approved, God blessed the Israelites by filling the tabernacle with his glory. It's important to emphasize that God's blessing after the completion of the tabernacle occurred after Moses descended from Mount Sinai a second time. And we talked about this a little bit before. Recall that when Moses just came down from Mount Sinai the first time, he saw the Israelites rejecting God's covenant and worshiping the golden calf. His, he broke the Ten Commandments on the ground and God judged and punished the Israelites for breaking their covenant. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai the second time, his face was radiant with the glory of God, and he returned with the second set of tablets, which were placed in the Ark of the Testimony under the mercy seat. Moses' first descent from Mount Sinai was followed by judgment, foreshadowing Jesus' first return to earth to take the saints away from the earth and impose judgment on Israel during the tribulation. Moses' second descent from Mount Sinai foreshadows Christ's return a second time after the tribulation when he will place his law in the hearts of his people and bring about his millennial kingdom on earth. So what we see here is the timing of the uh, building of the tabernacle following Moses' second descent, placing the Ten Commandments in the Ark of the Testimony and with the radiance of God really foreshadowing the two comings of Jesus, first to gather his church and the tribulation, followed by his return, placing the heart of the covenant into his people and his millennial rule on earth. We reach the conclusion of the book of Exodus. It points to the accomplishment of God's redemptive plan and the fulfillment of God's purpose. God's purpose for Israel was to bring them out of Egypt, make them into God's people, give them the law, guide them through the wilderness to the promised land. This is the redemptive, foreshadowing the redemptive plan that God has through Jesus Christ for the whole earth. So we've, we've, this book of Exodus has been a book about redemption. It starts with the slavery and bondage of the Israelites in Egypt, God calling Moses from the desert of Midian to lead his people out of bondage, build the nation of Israel to give them the law and for God to make these people, the Israelites, God's people and to bless them. The book ends with the Shekinah glory of God appearing over the tabernacle and God's presence in the midst of the Israelites. It will continue in the book of Numbers as they go through the wilderness. And we're going to take a pause in the book of Leviticus to talk about all the ways that God is holy and how God instructs his people to become holy like himself. So we, we're done with the book of Exodus, but the focus questions that I have for tonight, and we're going to open up with part two of these discussion questions, are on page 13 of the outline. So tonight, describe what the Israelites were required to do and how Moses inspected and approved the construction of the tabernacle. All of this foreshadowing what we as God's people are required to do and Jesus' judgment of our works.
In order to accomplish God's work on earth, we must discern from our relationship with God what he calls us to do, and then freely and voluntarily offer our gifts and services and follow the instructions which God gives us through the word and through the spirit. Mm -hmm. And then when we, God does not expect us to rely upon our own wisdom or abilities in the flesh. He gives us the gifts and guidance from the Holy Spirit to accomplish what God wants us to do. The work that we do for the Lord is accomplished by the Lord, not by us. And it's for God's right. glory, not for our own glory. Mm -hmm. Bob, I had a question. Um, sure. You had mentioned something had appeared seven times in the book of Exodus, and I forgot what it was. I was trying to remember. A discussion of the Sabbath. Mm 